Um, so, so, so I think one reason Ralph asked me, Ralph and Yusuf asked me to give this talk was my background, my trajectory is quite unusual. So my undergraduate degree, my PhD are both in applied math, um, from applied math departments, um, no statistics, uh, especially that, that era, right? So, um, and going back further, there are a few people in the room that I've known even longer. There's at least three of us speaking who are from uh, the applied math department Northwestern. So, um, so it's a very really small community, right? Like we all, we all know each other well. Um, when I got to SAMC, I was a postdoc at SAMC from 2006 to 2008, um, I started working quite closely with statisticians and it took me at least a year, I would say, to, to be able to understand the language and bridge the gap and, and probably close to a better part of a decade to, to really start to understand how they think about problems. And I think it's instructive, um, certainly working, you know, applied mathematicians and statisticians working together, but also working with domain scientists to, to really take the time and think about their problems and think about what's important to them. So I'm just wanting, hoping to set the stage today. So this is a pretty basic talk and, you know, some of you feel free to take a nap if you're an expert in this stuff. Um, but just so if you're coming in from one of the communities, you have a sort of flavor of, of the other and their approaches. All right, so, um, so in the last talk, we saw some great examples of, of, of you know, the kind of applications where we do uncertainty quantification, right? So here I've, I've listed several, right? So weather, climate, um, studying the universe, high energy physics, nuclear physics, et cetera. I myself have worked a, a fair bit on hazard forecasting. Um, often questions of design and materials, right? What these have in common is these are hard problems. These are hard problems where data is typically either quite limited, quite expensive, or doesn't exist. So in the hazard forecasting, so I work on volcanic hazards, um, you know, to get data, we have to sacrifice a graduate student to the volcano, right? So, so you know, this isn't, um, it's not trivial. Probably everyone laughs except for my graduate students <laughs> in the audience. Um, but what we have, of course, that's also in common with all of these things are, are um, you know, expensive computer models, right? We put a lot of work into understanding the physics or understanding the dynamics of the system. And these we hope to, to learn from, to understand what's going on, to make predictions, right? This is our goal. And how do we work with those expensive computer models to, to, to do these things? Um, and that's, that's the framework here, right? Both from the applied math perspective and from the statistics perspective. So um, again, this talks sort of on a tutorial level. So a lot of this um, draws from Ralph's book, which is, which is really nice. And Ralph and Jim are offering a course this semester about this stuff, so you can hear much more from him. From other talks and tutorials I've seen, um, specifically from Jim and Derek and Paul Constantine, but certainly from other people, I, I've stolen bits and pieces. And um, I, there's this really nice paper by Nathan Owen, who is a recent PhD of, um, of Peter Taylor at Exeter. And he does this sort of fair comparison of the applied math approach to emulators and the statistics approach to emulators. Right, and emulators are, are, are our strategy, right? There's, they are how we deal with um, having these very expensive computer models. Right, so, um, you know, the, the, the uh, basically the paper, you know, a really brief summary is they both work pretty well. Um, and I'll, I'll talk more about it later, but specifically if you're coming from one side or the other, I think this paper frames it quite nicely, comparing black box models, off the shelf methods, um, to, to, and explaining both. What I'm not going to talk about, what I thought I would when, when I wrote the title, um, is, is looking at reduced order models um, with things like proper orthogonal decomposition. It's a huge field. I think Nathan will touch on that kind of stuff tomorrow, or at least something similar in spirit, um, but, but that's not here. But here's a nice review paper, and there's, there's an associated book edited by some of the same people. Okay, so, um, so our models, I'm typically thinking of some kind of dynamical system of the model. 
right? So I have a state u, and I have some right-hand side of this equation that might, you know, might have uh, spatial differential operators and such, but I've written it quite simply. Typically what we have are our initial conditions, boundary conditions, and parameters, right? And for uq, what we're looking for is this mapping. We'd like to be able to just exercise the computer model instantly, but instead it takes hours or minutes or days or months. Right, so what we want is some mapping from these initial conditions, boundary conditions, parameters, to the model solution, the state, or some functional of the state. Right, those are typically the things we're thinking about. And in the language of computer models, right, I have some computer model that maps inputs to outputs. Right, so this is, um, this is our framework. And what do we want to do? Of course, uh, Dr. Oden covered the, you know, the sorts of things we want to do quite nicely with the specific examples in the last talk but we might just want to understand the computer model, right? We might want to think about an approximation. We might want to do an optimization problem with that computer model, right? So, so what's, some, um, what's some design that optimizes expense uh, for an automobile or for uh, an aircraft? Um, often, our quant our, what we're thinking about is doing integrals, and sometimes we want to do inverse problems, right? Of course, again, which is what Dr. Odin covered nicely in the last talk. Right, so these are the sorts of things we want to do. And our issue is the expense of the computer models. OK, so, so here's my terminology. So inputs, they can include anything you like. So parameters, initial conditions, boundary conditions, some kind of external forcing. As opposed to functions, right? So a function is going to take in whatever independent variable. The independent variable in the model, it might be an input, it might not. Right, so, so just keep that in mind with the word input. For outputs, um, we're thinking about quantities that we can experimentally measure, um, or measure experimentally or, or numerically, right? So um, now often it's some functional of the dependent variable. So, so one quantity of interest, not, not necessarily the whole, the whole state. Right, again, which Dr. Oden touched on nicely. And then we have quantities of interest, right? These are the things we care about. Um, so statistical quantities we want to calculate, maybe averages or variances or exceedance probabilities, right? These are the sort of things we'd like to do to make predictions and forecasts on all of these complicated systems. Okay, so notation. So I stole this slide directly from Ralph, um, and I, but I think it's instructive because these are notations used in different communities to talk about inputs. Right, so in the math control community, we have Q going from 1 to P, indexed from 1 to P in dimension. In the reduced, math, in the, um, reduced order community, we have P going from 1 to Q. Active subspaces has X going from 1 to P. Generically in statistics, we, we like theta, so we have theta going from 1 to D. And in computer models, our inputs are X's, so X going from 1 to D. And um, it's not so much, you know, you can have your favorite notation, or you can be in one of these fields and have your own notation. It's not that, it's just to recognize that when people are saying the words, the notation might not match what you know those words to be. And that's important to think about if you're watching someone from another community. Right? And the same, same goes for the sort of output response notation. Okay, so, and, you know, and applied mathematicians aren't, aren't crazy for not using X, right? Um, and, and here we have this sort of simple, groundwater flow model. So um, this is, I, I, I put this up for the statisticians in particular because this is sort of a canonical example. This is a, sort of the first go-to problem, right? So you'll probably see this. Um, so I have some flow through of porous media. I'm looking at Darcy's law here, which says the velocity is proportional to the gradient of the pressure of the fluid and that diff um, diffusion coefficient well, the, the media is going to be heterogeneous, and that's going to vary spatially, right? And so we're going to model that as a random field. And then the, if I look at the divergence of the velocity, well, if, if um, you're conserving mass, the right-hand side would be zero, but maybe there's a source or a sink, right? So if I put these two together, I get an elliptic PDE of this form. And with it have a PDE, I have boundary conditions. So here I set them to be zero, but they could be some more interesting function. Right, so given some specification of this random field A, the goal is to say, okay, 
what is u at these different spatial values, right? What is the pressure of, um, of this field subsurface? Right, these are things we, we want to know. These are problems of interest. And um, x is a spatial variable, right? So that's, that's their resistance to using x for inputs, I would, I would guess. OK, so this is sort of a, the standard problem. Um, so notation for this talk, though. Right, so I'm going to think about my computer model being G. Um, my inputs are x from 1 to n. So I have n-dimensional um, input space. Again, parameters, boundary conditions, initial conditions, whatever is important for you, for your problem. And the outputs are responses. I'm going to take them to be scalar. They don't have to be scalar. Um, I'll call those y. The design is going to be the set of inputs that I run the computer model at. Right, so I've indexed that with a script D, and then I have M of those runs. And then I have the corresponding output, right? So I ran my computer model on some supercomputer for hours, and I get this output YM. Um, and then I have a quantity of interest. Just for simplicity, I'm just going to look at my quantity of interest to be the expectation of this computer model under some distribution of the inputs. Right? You, of course, you can think about um, more interesting you can have any function of the computer model you like here, right, and, and compute a similar quantity. Okay, so this is, this is where we're starting. All right, um, and I was just trying to think about how to, where are these methods similar, the applied math approach and the stats approach, and where are they different? And where I see the sort of big commonalities are that they're both utilizing some kind of basis functions in the approximation, right, Bo both of them. That's, um, they, they look different, but but that's, that's a commonality. And then where you do the computer model runs is important. And how you choose that is quite different depending on the approach you take. Right? But these things, um, these things are there. The differences I've been trying to think about too, because um, they seem subtle, but I actually don't think they are. Um, so the statistical emulator, which I'm going to use a Gaussian process for, so my, my shorthand GP is there for the rest of the talk. I'm going to approximate the computer model, right? I'm going to approximate the computer model. I'm going to get probabilistic uncertainty estimates for approximating the computer model in places I didn't run it, right? That's, that's basically what a GP gives us. And the applied math approach, um, which I have there is polynomial chaos expansion. I know people like different terms, but just for simplicity, I'm going to stick with that. We're approximating the quantity of interest. And in that approximation to the quantity of interest, we get, um, we get an error bound on that. Right? So we're getting different things out of these two approaches. And I think that's important to think about based on the problem you want to solve, right? what, what you might be going for. OK, so, um, so let's think about um, how we look at polynomial chaos. So I have some. I have some vector of random variables, capital X there. They come from some multinomial distribution. I'm taking independent in each dimension. I have n dimensions again. And so I have the product of these um, uh, one-dimensional PDFs. Uh, this notation is a bit cumbersome, but I just wanted to note which dimension I'm in. Right? So if it's indexed with an i, I'm in the ith dimension in that product. And of course, my, um, my computer model is then a random function or my output of my computer model is going to be a random function of these inputs since they're random. OK, so now this random variable y can be expanded onto an orthogonal, po orthogonal polynomial basis. And this notation is very dense, right? So let me, let me explain this to you. So, so, um, so basically here these size are going to be orthogonal polynomials. And here I'm adding up all of them, infinities of them, right? In each of the dimensions for my random variables, I'm going to have a set of these polynomials. And then I also have to take cross terms. Right? So I have all of these polynomials, right? Infinities of these. And each of them has this weight A, right? So um, here the, the alpha is a, a funny multinomial index, but that's the idea. Each of these polynomial terms gets a, gets a weight with it. And for several choices of the density, um, we, know that we know the polynomial bases we should use. Right? That's kind of key here. So if you give me a density, 
there's often an associated polynomial basis that's going to work nicely. If, and in particular, it's going to be orthogonal, right? So if I, if I take the expectation of pairs against the density of the random variable, um, then this integral is either going to be zero or it's going to be a delta function with some normalizing constant. If I know these pairs, normal colonizing constants are known too. Those, those are lookups, right? So, so this, is, this is the sort of background for the approach. And I should mention, um, I, I tried to include references by no means are any list of references exhaustive. I mean, it would be, you know, reams of slides of references. Um, so, so my apologies if I miss your favorites. Okay, so just an example for a Gaussian case, um, the family of polynomials we would look at are, are the Hermite polynomials. So the zeroth order is one, the first order is X, et cetera, et cetera. I could write these down forever, right? And then we have the normalizing um, coefficients there as well, right? So, so these would be the things, and now we need to find, well, what are the appropriate weights to combine these in this, in this 1D case? Okay, so, so, but assuming I have those weights, well, then I can plug them in, right? Now I can plug into my quantity of interest or, or some other quantity of interest. I can plug in um, this expansion. So in for G here goes this series. And, and in the 1D case, you can see it. All I'm gonna get are, all I'm gonna get are these constant terms because the rest of them integrated against one are gonna be zero by, by construction, right? So I'm just gonna get the constant, the A's that go with the constant terms. And here I'm gonna get, I'm gonna end up with all of these, um, you know, products of these guys, but most of those integrals are gonna be zero except for the ones we know the normalizing constant to, right? So now these, the sorts of integrals we're interested in are free, right? We can just write them down. That's some um, delta functions are great that way or things that are orthogonal. But of course, nothing's free, right? So it's a trade here. We need to at some point truncate this series of polynomials, and we need to find these coefficients, right? So this is, this is the work in polynomial chaos is, is these two ideas. So I'm gonna truncate, you know, I'm just gonna say, okay, maybe use two terms or four terms of, um, of a polynomial expansion. And um, we still need to determine A, so that'll come in a minute. Um, my size here now are gonna be this vector of truncated polynomials, this capital Psi. And, and what we go up to on the order of the polynomial, or, or how many terms we keep, let me, let me say it that way, because P here is probably gonna define the order of the polynomial, but how many terms we end up keeping in this summation will depend on the order of the polynomial you want. It depends, on, um, it depends on the number of variables, of uh, input variables that you're considering, and, um, and your truncation strategy, right? So there's, there's sort of two common approaches, total order and tensor order, to give you slightly different combinations of the cross terms. Um, but uh, I won't get into that, right? So, so we have to truncate somewhere, and then we have to find these coefficients. Right, so um, one way to do this coefficients, and let me go back here, right? So here I have an approximation, and now I'm just gonna take the difference, right? I'm gonna take the difference, move this sum to the other side, and look for the A's that minimize this guy, right? So, so we have this sort of, we could do a least squares approach here. Um, we can have some fancier optimization routines, lasso or some L1 penalization, whatever you like. Um, there's some restrictions on, on the size of the design, the number of design points you would need, um, but not on the structure so much. You could use something like Sobolev sequences. Um, and this, this is sort of a nice uh, black box approach. Probably more, more common, um, the sorts of things we see are to take an inner product of these basis functions, um, to take an inner product of these basis functions with our random variable, right? So this is a sort of interval we're looking at to find these, these A constants. And, and so here we have it. And really what it amounts to is how you do this integral. The expensive part of this integral is that G is expensive to evaluate, right? The computer model is expensive. That's what you wanna keep in mind. So we're gonna have some kind of numerical integration here, right? 
And the numerical integration scheme you choose is going to be what really determines your design for this sort of um, projection approach. So lots of people work with quadrature rules for numerical integration. I mean, the, the sort of beauty of this approach is we've inherited a centuries of numerical analysis work and have a nice problem to apply it to, right? So you get some really nice convergence, much better than Monte Carlo. Um, if the dimension of the inputs is too big, you know, you might have to be, you might use a sampling based scheme. Something I didn't get into, but is a sort of similar in spirit is instead of using these orthogonal polynomials, so you use Lagrange polynomials. Um, that will make a sort of similar in spirit process into an interpolating emulator. Okay. So um, here's some attributes of the sort of polynomial um, chaos approach. And um, so, so the stochastic co-location interpolates polynomial chaos does it typically. Um, again, I mentioned this, but we inherit a lot of this numerical analysis theory on convergence, um, which of course gives us integrals in particular much faster than Monte Carlo. We have some challenges dealing with correlated inputs, right? So if that noise is correlated, that's problematic. And you know, there are lots of these things, there are strategies to deal with. I think um, Akhil's gonna talk about some stuff like that tomorrow, maybe not that particular problem. Um, we face the curse of dimensionality, and so, but this is, makes the problem really appropriate for, for sparse grid techniques. Now, you know, I think this is common in the two approaches too. It's like, well, what's the problem? And that's the research, right? Um, what's hard, and then that's what we're gonna work on. And, and I think this is something that's really, um, the polynomial chaos approaches do quite naturally um, that, that Gaussian processes struggle with. Um, and not, that people, not that people aren't working on it, um, but that it's a harder problem is that the quantity of interest can be high dimensional. I can get that whole flow field U at all of the spatial dimensions I want and, and quantify its uncertainty in this form quite naturally, right? And, and with a Gaussian process, that would be a much trickier problem. Okay, so um, on to Gaussian processes. Any um, questions about polynomial chaos will be directed to Ralph. <laughs> 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 Otherwise, they go on to Gaussian processes. Okay, so, so again, you know, so I'm thinking about this quantity of interest, it could be something more interesting than that. And here the idea is that we're emulating the computer model itself, right? So in some sense, um, the distribution of the inputs doesn't matter for the emulation, right? Which, which, is, um, which is useful, I think. So our goal then is we wanna predict with uncertainty what the computer model looks like at untested inputs. Okay, so our strategy is to view um, the computer model as a single realization from a random process. And in particular, we use Gaussian processes because Gaussians are, are easy to work with and tractable. Not, not um, because, um, you know, often your assumptions are because you have a tool, right? So, so that we have a tool here. And um, we have the, sort of inventor of this in the room in front of us, uh, Jerry Sachs, along with others of this approach. So um, random functions. So here I have a random function or several draws of a random function um, with sort of shorter range correlations, more wiggly. And here I have some random functions with longer range correlations, less wiggly, right? Wiggly is the technical term. Um, and, and and I, I think it's instructive just to think of really what we're thinking is, well, our computer model, that we don't actually observe the whole function, we just observe um, a few evaluations of, it's gonna be one of these draws. So, so, so I think people somehow think, well, you're, you're assuming that the computer model is Gaussian. There's nothing about this function that looks particularly Gaussian shaped to me, right? Um, it's, it just happens to be a draw from this class of functions, right? So our emulator is coming from this class of functions. And what's Gaussian about it is that any, any X value, any input location, if we take a marginal, that thing is Gaussian, right? That's, um, that's what we're looking at. So, so that's where our, our uh, emulator setup happens then, right? So I have, um, I have y here is some mean mu plus a Gaussian random variable, that's a function of x. Expectation zero, variance sigma squared, um, so it's just a normal zero sigma squared. 
I want to talk about the mean a little bit. Um, this is sort of quite philosophical how different practitioners of Gaussian processes treat the mean. Some people normalize the data, get rid of the mean, everything's zero mean, I'm just going to focus on the Gaussian process. Some people put as many sort of polynomial terms as they can in, have that do the work, and the Gaussian process do the extra. Right? Again, it's kind of a philosophical approach. Um, for simplicity, I'm just going to think about a constant mean going forward, but the mean doesn't have to be constant. Okay. And then we have the correlation, and this is a sort of connection to basis functions. Right? So here we have a power exponential correlation function. This, these phi i's here, we have one in each dimension that's separable, so I'm taking the product of these over each input dimension. The phi's here um, control those correlation links, right? So this is the range parameter. This is, this is what we need to find, right? This is sort of the hard part of the problem is finding what the appropriate phi's are. Um, once we have the correlation structure, this one's popular. I think probably return is becoming more popular. You're certainly not stuck to this one. There's honestly lots of interesting work going on different correlation structures for Gaussian processes. It's, um, it's, it's really some stuff that's pretty exciting. Um, but for, and then we have um, the covariance matrix, right? It's just that correlation matrix scaled if we plug in all the pairs of M design points. Okay. So, here are the runs from my computer model. Um, so I have my inputs x, you know, I can only plot things in one dimension, maybe two if I'm lucky. Um, so I have inputs x and outputs y. So I run my computer model, each of these takes an hour or a day or something, and I get my responses. Okay, so now um, I'm not gonna think about all random functions. I'm going to think about the, the subset of those random functions that happen to go through these computer model evaluations. Right? So here, um, for a more wiggly choice of this range parameter, these random functions go through these uh, computer model evaluations. If I choose a different phi, I get random functions that go through those computer model evaluations. Right? So, so here we have this kind of optimization problem of choosing the right range parameters. Right? Which of these is, is most likely? Because working with Gaussians, we have the likelihoods. Right? So, um, so we have our simulator runs at the design points. Right? Those blue dots are what we're working with. And we have our vector responses that follow a, a multivariate normal distribution. Okay. So we need to find the mean. Again, I'm just going to think about constant mean. We need to find the mean, find the variance, find those range parameters. Um, you can use maximum likelihood estimates. That's, that's the first approach, right? Um, so here's what that likelihood looks like. Like, what are those parameter values? And here, when I say parameters, they're not parameters in the computer model, right? These are parameters in the Gaussian process. Um, even though it's, sometimes it's called non-parametric, right? That's a, it's a funny thing. Um, Semi-parametric. Um, so, so what are the best computer models given what are the, the best parameters for the Gaussian process given our computer model runs, our set of computer model runs? All right, so we can set up the likelihood. Um, and if we have those estimates, right, once we have estimates of phi, we can plug them into that correlation matrix. Right, that's where that gets a hat. And then consider, well, what would our computer model give us where we didn't do the runs, where we didn't exercise the computer model? What would we get? Right, so the mean of that process is given by this uh, sort of so-called plug-in estimate, but pretty straightforward to write down, um, as is the, the estimated variance of that process. And here the key is, and, and again, where this sort of projection idea, uh, or not projection, where this um, relying on basis expansions comes from, is on this little r term here. So little r is an m vector of the correlations between your untested points and all of your design points, right? And, and, and that's where we're sort of um, picking up this idea of approximating your computer model with something like radial basis functions. Okay, so here we have our predictive emulator with uncertainty. Again, there's no, I've not thought about probability on these inputs at all, right? I'm thinking about probability on the computer model. And we can see here if I'm, if I'm near one of the runs, well, my estimate's gonna be quite close to the predicted mean. I didn't plot the true function I used here, right? I've just pl plotted the predictive mean in the 95% um, envelope 
of the um, of the those confidence interval there, and and so here now when we're when we're so so we might go to the mean for at some untested input to get an approximation of what our computer model is doing. If we're far away from a design point, well, we're going to be less certain, right? Um, so here these bounds are bigger. Another thing to notice here is if we're near the edge of the domain, we're quite uncertain, right? And this sort of goes back to the philosophy of what should you do with the mean. If you put in, say, a linear mean, I actually think I stuck a linear mean in this guy, but if you put in a linear mean um, and your slope estimate is off on the linear mean, and your Gaussian process wants to go back to the mean outside of the, the sort of convex hull of the design, well, this can be problematic if you're, if you're on the edges, right? And your, um, your uncertainty is going to be quite high. Okay, so, so let's talk about design a little bit. Um, so generally, you want to think about the design where to run the computer models being space filling, right? And, and again, you know, that's sort of the parallels between the design for, the design for polynomial chaos came from these quadrature rules. Right? So it's a very different looking kind of design. Um, so here we want something that's space filling. And, and in particular, we don't want a grid. No grids for Gaussian processes. Um, so the design should, if I, wanna, if I think about projecting onto a coordinate axis, I still want there to be M points on that axis. And I want them to look you know, kind of random. There's this idea of sort of spreading out those points and so looking for a maximum design. Right, so if you, if you generate, you have MATLAB or R generate a bunch of um, Latin hypercube designs for you, then you'd like to pick the one where um, the minimum pairwise distance between all of your design points is maximized. Right, this is the sort of thing you would do in practice. We also have this um, possibility for sequential design, and that's, a, again, a much, trickier, a much trickier thing in polynomial chaos unless you're looking at the interpolator sort of co-location idea. Um, but for sequential design here, well, we might want to put new points um, where the inspected improvement of some, um, basically where our variance is high, um, or if there's some feature of interest that we're, that we're looking for, maybe we could put points there. All right, so here's a, just a cartoon of a two-dimensional design, right? So here's my uh, sort of maximum Latin hypercube design. Um, I'm looking at the projections onto each individual axis, and it has a sort of property we want. And if I was going to do a sequential design, well, it might pick up to put a point in here, to put a point up there, right? These are the sorts of um, design things we'd look at. And, and again, you know, people spend their sort of whole careers thinking about how to do this in a smart way, right? This is just uh, an overview. Okay, some pros and cons of Gaussian processes. Um, it's an interpolator of the simulator um, at these design responses and response points, right at the input output points. Um, it provides an assessment for, oh, these, this quotes are quotes a, of, of Jim Berger. It provides an assessment of the accuracy of the approximation, which is quite reliable when it's not crazy. <laughs> um, the separable form allows a lot of flexibility in, in fitting um, the Gaussian processes in these different input dimensions. Some disadvantages. Maximum likelihood estimates can be unreliable. Um, we have these matrix inversions in the, in that, correlation, in that covariance matrix, correlation matrix. And um, of course, there's lots of smart computational linear algebra tools to, to deal with such things, but there's some statistical ones as well. And these Gaussian processes are stationary, right? Which isn't always actually a, a good model as an emulator, right? So, um, but again, and you know, I'm, I'm going to let um, uh, Akil get into some of the fancier things you do with, with um, polynomial chaos tomorrow, but there are some approaches to deal with these sorts of things that exist. I'm just going to give you a, like a brief snapshot. Right? So this is, a, I think, a, an example of Jerry's where we have um, a Gaussian process fit to nine design points or it's ten design points. The, true, the, the red function is the true function, same function, right? It's just the number of design points, 9 to 10. Um, 
And on the left, you see the sort of normal kind of football or sausage plot that we expect with Gaussian processes. And on the right, this isn't very useful, right? So it interpolates, it goes through your, your Gaussian processes. But what this is really saying is, well, I think, you know, 95% probability my computer model is going to give me something between minus 7 and 7, right? I mean, so, so it's completely sort of not useful. And um, this can happen if your estimates of your range parameters are way off. And this will often happen if you're using MLEs and the likelihood surface is a little crazy, right? So um, it might be correct, but it's a little crazy. So the optimization routine can't quite handle it and things get sent to zero or infinity. Okay, so um, there's, a, there's a strategy to get around this, which is to look at sort of a twofold strategy. So to look at a marginal likelihood. So integrate out the mean and variance terms over some objective prior. And then think about a mode posterior instead of estimate, instead of an MLE, right? So we're going to estimate the range parameters using a reference prior and look for the mode posterior. And basically, we get very similar kind of plug-in results and a much more stable optimization problem to find that mode posterior. So this is work by Mingyang Gu and, and Jim. And there's both a paper and an R package that I want to point you to. Um, so I'll leave that there for a minute if you want to write it down or take a picture. Um, you know, and, and if you don't care about the details, right, the R package is there to use anyway, as, as they are. Um, so, okay. Um, so some other issues that the, the Gaussian process community has sort of been working on. Um, Non-stationarity. So there's this idea of tree Gaussian processes that partition the space and fit Gaussian processes on these, on these partitions, different Gaussian processes. Um, this is a really nice approach. It's been around for, for a while now. Um, but one thing, though, it, it partitions orthogonal to the coordinate axes. Maybe, maybe that's not right. So there, I know there's, there's work on, on other strategies to do something similar going on currently. Um, there's ideas of kernel mixture models for dealing with, um, with non-stationarity. So there's a, a recent paper, this might just be a submission by Volodina and Williamson. And you can think about the problem of large correlation matrices. So again, you, know, you, you get your favorite um, numerical linear algebra thing to, to deal with that big inverse. Um, but there's other approaches by looking at uh, compactly supported covariance functions. Right, that make that, um, that make that correlation matrix sparse and easy to work with. Right, so, so, so again, the sort of problems generate ideas for, for us to work on, right? And, and there's many more and many more that we'll hear about in this workshop. Okay, so um, I wanted to go back to this sort of Gaussian process versus polynomial chaos. So this is a figure out of this paper um, by Nathan Owen. And um, let me give you the... Let me, let me tell you what's going on here. Okay, so, um, but there's, the, there's the, the answer. It's a fair fight, right? So, so what we're looking at in red are uh, polynomial chaos. In blue, and, or I guess it's blue and purple, it looks like, are two Gaussian processes, one with a matern and one with a power exponential. Again, these are all sort of off the shelf. The computer model this was run on was just black box as well, right? So we're working with a black box computer model, a real computer model, but black box. I think they, they used a two or three in the paper. Um, and now, so I have three different quantities of interest. So some root mean squared error with the, with the true. Um, some, uh, the mean of the, the um, computer model and the, the variance or the standard deviation. Okay, so here, Right, so the colors we got down, the rows we got down. On the columns, what I'm thinking about are different kinds of design. Um, and one and two are both Sobolev sequences where we use the, um, where we use the um, likelihood approach to find the A coefficients in polynomial chaos. This one has twice as many points as that one, right? And this is, so it needs a bit more points to do well. Uh, but you can see in this middle column, all three do pretty well. You know, expect Gaussian processes to do well with, with Sobolev sequences, right? And I would say it's kind of all equivalent. Um, you see bars on the Gaussian processes that you don't see on the polynomial chaos because you have error estimates there, 
right, that come through whatever this calculation of the quantity of interest. Is. You have um, probabilistic error estimates, let me say it that way, that come through this quantity of interest. Um, and class three is looking at a design picked for polynomial chaos, right, which should be not good for Gaussian processes. Um, and, you know, basically with enough points, things still do pretty well, right? So, so the moral of this paper is it's kind of a fair fight, but of course, there's not bells and whistles. Everyone has their favorite bell and whistle on the problem they work on. No, none of that's used here. And I think, again, it comes back to um, what is your goal and what do you want out of the problem, right? So, um, so, so this is what I think, you know, in my perspective, this is Elaine's perspective, in my perspective, what the two methods really have going for them. In polynomial chaos, you get these really high dimensional quantities of interest, um, uncertainty quantification on them, um, naturally, you don't have to do anything, do anything extra. You don't have to do anything fancy for this really high dimensional output. For Gaussian processes, we have this um, prediction uncertainty estimate of the simulator itself, of the computer model, as opposed to some single estimate of the quantity of interest. Right, so these I, I think are the, the sort of big, you know, flavors of why I might choose one over another for a given problem. And um, let me just sort of wrap up with something that, um, that I've worked on for a long time. And, and let me tell you where this comes from and, um, and, and why I think it's an interesting plot that sort of shows some of the power of Gaussian processes. So we're thinking about um, volcanic landslides. And here I have the valley they're going down. This fee is not a range parameter, just stolen from a different talk. Um, I'm thinking about the valley that the landslides are going down. That's one of my input parameters. And I'm thinking about the volume of the flowing mass. That's another input parameter, right? So, so in this problem, they're kind of, I don't know, initial condition, boundary condition, respectively. And, and the really unfortunate thing about volcanic landslides um, physically is that the larger the volume of the material, the more mobile the flow is. Right, that's bad, right? It's bad on a, on a number of fronts because hey, you have much more data on the small volume flows. Right? So you want to learn this, the, you want to learn this, um, this uh, sort of mobility relationship while you're going to train on this data you have that small volume, most of it. Right? So that's unfortunate. Um, and it's unfortunate, of course, if you, if you live there because the larger the volume, the, the, the more likely it is to, to keep going, right? So, so that's bad. So you can model, um, but you can model that relationship between the mobility or, um, and in the volume, right? And, and that, that comes in through uh, this basal friction term, sort of how much does the ground slow down the flow, right? So you can model that, but then you get this sort of correlated input, um, you know, so sort of correlated model in your input space. All right, and then you also have uncertainty in the computer model, right? So here, here what I'm looking at, um, I'm not looking at the output of the whole Gaussian process. I'm looking at, um, well, which are, if I'm above all of these massive curves, then the location I thought about for, for this particular um, figure got inundated, right? Those are, those are scenarios, valleys and volumes that would lead to inundation. And I have this family of curves because A, I can sample that Gaussian process and include uncertainty for not running the computer model everywhere. And I can sample that parametric, I can sample that correlated relationship between the volume and the friction. And sampling those, I can account for uncertainty in both in this sort of separation between, um, you know, relative safety and certain, certain death. Um, so, so, so now I have this measure of uncertainty there, and this is completely divorced from any kind of probability of the input scenario, right? And that's really powerful, because now, now I can think about, um, I can think about now these integrals, I have these curves, these integrals are cheap. They end up here or here, right, for each of those curves, right? So I can think about that, um, very efficiently in this, in this um, with using Gaussian processes in these ways, which I think is quite powerful. I think um, Robert might talk more about this problem on Thursday, um, give you some more details. 
But I'm gonna I'm gonna wrap up, and um, I, you know, I th I think Dr. Oden probably pounded into your head in his, his talk. But there's no point to any of this if we're not thinking about um, that the model's not really representing reality, or maybe even what we're observing, right? And that always has to be there. You could have you could do the sort of um, best approximation to whatever computer model you like, and it might just be a completely useless exercise, right? So that's certainly something to keep in mind. Um, and I'll take questions and I'll take answers. <laughs>